going to continue today in 2 Kings chapter 8. And this ongoing saga of Israel's history during an era when Elijah and Elisha were raised up by God to bring his justice to the kingdoms of Ephraim Israel and of Judah. Now, Elijah operated almost exclusively in the northern kingdom. And while the bulk of Elisha's work was there also, we do find him dealing in the southern kingdom areas to some degree. And we continue to have to be careful as we read these passages to understand that at times the reference to Israel is only to the northern kingdom. And at other times, although it's infrequent, it means all Israel in the sense of northern and southern kingdoms together. Now, we need to keep in mind that there was a divine purpose for the Lord raising up these two powerful prophets that not only brought the Lord's prophetic oracle to the Israelites, but they also had a hand in causing these miracles to happen. Elisha's spiritual gifts went even further than his master Elias, so that Elisha was able to see into men's thoughts at times. He could discern the future. No doubt this ability was on a case-by-case -case basis as directed by Jehovah. Now most typical prophets were anointed men who were set apart for service to Jehovah and they discerned God's word of instruction. And they either brought it to a king or as Isaiah and others, they were also used by God as an instrument of warning. An instrument of warning the people of their precarious condition that had been caused by their willful idolatry and their apostasy. And they told them what was going to happen if they didn't change their ways. The, but the prophets, Elijah and Elisha, you see, were established as kind of a divine counterbalance against the Israelite kings who rebelled against the Lord. And so those two men also acted to fill the void that had been caused by the absence of a Levitical priesthood in the northern kingdom and a, a steadily deteriorating one in the southern kingdom. In fact, the existence of these several large prophet guilds in cities scattered around uh, the promised land, but mostly in central and northern Israel, are proof that a kind of replacement or alternative priesthood had been created, consisting of these prophets from various tribes instead of the priestly descendants of Aaron. And this was in order to keep the, the word of God alive within a backslidden Israel. And one reason for the Lord taking these extraordinary measures was because Queen Jezebel had brought the worship of her god, Baal, from her homeland of Sidon and transplanted it into Israel with the goal of stamping out Jehovah uh, uh, worship. And she had been quite successful in her efforts because the road to achieve this goal had been paved by these wicked actions and policies of earlier Israelite monarchs. Now, starting with the um, first king of the northern kingdom, Jeroboam, the Israelites of the north had been essentially barred from access to the temple in Jerusalem, and by national policy, they were discouraged from seeking the one true source of truth and light, the God of Israel. Now, we don't find that the general population was necessarily harmed for their faith, However, we do see that the religious leadership of steadfast Jehovah followers were seen as a danger to the state. So they were targeted for extermination. And that the people who clung to the Lord 
were considered nonconformists, to be looked down upon and therefore to be shunned. But there was another reason for the existence of so many common prophets who lived in the communal prophet guilds. In time, the Lord would move to severely oppress his chosen people in punishment for their unabated apostasy. And he would make it clear to them through yet other prophets that they had apostatized not in ignorance but in willful choice. They would not be able to say that they didn't know God's Torah or his will because even though the official priesthood and the kings that the Lord had, had ordained were failing their people, doing all in their power to erect a wall between the people and God, there were hundreds and hundreds of prophets who were dedicated teachers of God's word, who kept that word alive and well within the land. It's only that the bulk of the population dutifully followed their leaders and they grew to prefer something else. Now, while I'm no prophet, all right, like Elijah or Elisha or Isaiah, I still want to add my voice to many other teachers of the word who are greatly alarmed at what we see happening all around us. It's as if we are reliving the era of the judges or perhaps the biblical kings all over again. And in churches and synagogues everywhere, people have become willfully ignorant of God's word. And they prefer instead to accept the more attractive traditions of men as their path and their source of truth. Now naturally, this has led to societies that more and more see Christianity as an obstacle to peace and harmony. And that those who teach of an absolute morality as defined by the Bible as dangerous haters Clinging to God's word is only for the unintelligent, the unenlightened, the superstitious, the backward. Many things that God says epitomize evil in his eyes are what our political and religious leaders now call good. And we're taught in our public education systems now that these things are normal, even desirable. And they must be accepted by society in general. Those who oppose it are called bigots. We're said to suffer from one sort of phobia or another. And I must say, it's not the condition of the secular world, the pagan, non-God-fearing world that concerns me. Pagans act like pagans because they're pagans. What else would we expect of them? See, as a teacher of the word, it is the world of church and synagogue that concerns me. Those who claim to be God's people, but they behave more like their pagan neighbors, that concerns me. Those who claim their salvation, but they go on living as though nothing of any significance has changed in their lives or they don't accept God's commandments as truth and light, but rather kind of suggestions. Or they distort those Bible truths to such a high degree as to turn their plain meaning and their intent upside down. Let us pay close attention as the book of 2 Kings moves along because we see the pattern continue is developed mainly in the book of Judges as to how God responds to such apostasy, idolatry, and general unfaithfulness. And because God never changes in contemporary times, we are simply living out that same old pattern again. However, since modern Christianity finds a little, if any, relevance 
of the Old Testament history to our New Testament faith in Christ, then they, then we, can be oblivious to the reality that we are merely actors in a play that has been repeated before. And so the outcome, the final act, is absolutely certain. And no amount of our denials, no amount of our offense at being accused of rebellion against God is going to change any of that. Only changing our ways, only returning to the true religion of the Bible, the combined wisdom of the Old and the New Testaments, and the faith practiced by the first and second generations of believers, only in that is there going to be any meaningful effect. Let's reread part of 2 Kings chapter 8. We're going to start at verse 7. Starting on page 409 if you have a complete Jewish Bible. Elisha went to Damasek, Damascus. Ben-Hadad, the king of Aram, was ill, and he was told, The man of God has come here. And the king said to Hazel, Take with you a gift and go meet the man of God and consult Adonai through him and ask if I'll recover from this illness. Hazel went to meet him, taking with him a gift that included everything good that Damasek had, 40 camel loads. He came and stood before him and said, Your son, Ben-Hadad, king of Aram, has sent me to ask you. And he asks, Will I recover from this illness? And Elisha answered, Go and say to him, You will surely recover, even though Adonai has shown me that he will surely die. Then the man of God fixed his gaze on him for so long that Hazael became embarrassed. And finally Elisha began to cry. And Hazael asked, Why is my Lord crying? And he answered, Because I know the disasters that you will bring on the people of Israel. You will set their fortress on fire. You will kill their young men with the sword. You will dash their little ones to pieces and rip their pregnant women apart. And Hazael says, But... But what is your servant? Nothing but a dog. How could he do anything of such a magnitude? And Elisha answered, Adonai has shown me that you will be king over Aram. And then he left Elisha and he returned to his master who asked him, What did Elisha say to you? And he told me you would surely recover. The next day he took a blanket, he dipped it in water, he spread it on his face so that he died. And Hazael took his place as king. It was when Yoram, the son of Ahav, king of Israel, was in the fifth year of his reign that Yoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, began his rule over Judah. He was 32 years old when he began to rule, and he ruled eight years in Jerusalem. And he lived after the example of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahav, because he married Ahav's daughter. He did what was evil from Adonai's perspective. However, Adonai was unwilling to destroy Judah because of his servant David, inasmuch as he had promised to give him and his children a lamp that would burn forever. And during this time, Edom revolted against Judah and set up its own king. And in response, Yoram crossed to Zaire with all of his chariots. And at night, he and his chariot commanders set out and attacked Edom who had surrounded him. Then the people fled to their tents. Nevertheless, since that day, Edom has remained free of Judah's domination. Libna revolted at the same time. Other activities of Yoram and his accomplishments are recorded in the annals of the kings of Judah. Yoram slept with his ancestors and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. And Ahaziah, his son, took his place as king. It was in the twelfth year of Yoram, the son of Ahab, king of Israel, that Ahaziah, the son of Yoram, king of Judah, began his reign. Akajah was 22 years old when he began to rule. He ruled for one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Ataliah, Athalia, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel. He lived after the example of the house of Ahab. He did what was evil from Adonai's perspective, as had the house of Ahab, for he was a son-in-law in the house of Ahab. With Yoram, the son of Ahab, he went to war against Hazael, king of Aram, at remote Gilead. And the Aramim wounded Yoram. King Yoram returned to Jezreel to be healed of the wounds which the Aramim had inflicted on him at Ramah while fighting Hazael, king of Aram. 
Ahaziah, the son of Yoram, king of Judah, went down to visit Yoram, the son of Ahab in Jezreel, because he was not feeling well. Last week, we examined verse 10 pretty closely, because it seems to say that God told Elisha that he was to tell this gravely ill king of Aram that he would survive his infirmity even though in fact he would not. And whether one interprets the scripture passage to mean that this was the Lord who ordered Elisha to tell this lie or it was Elisha's own thought to do so, nonetheless it's kind of troubling to us. Especially since neither Ben-Hadad nor Hazael were behaving as enemies. And in fact they were showing proper respect to Jehovah as well as to his prophet Elisha. But as we discovered, in reality, the oldest Hebrew manuscripts we have show that the Hebrew word lo is included in saying whether the king would recover or not. And lo means no or not. Thus what it actually says is that Elisha told Hazael that Ben-Hadad would not recover from his sickness. And then in the next phrase, it seems to simply repeat that same sentiment using the words, even though Jehovah has shown me, you shall surely die. So you will not recover even though you'll die. But that's kind of confusing. The sense that is meant, I have no doubt, was that the king of Aram wouldn't die of his illness, but he would nonetheless die of something else. And that's exactly what soon transpired. There was no lying by God or Elisha involved, not even any cunning words that kind of distorted or hid the truth. What happened next was truly dramatic and gut-wrenching. And there's a sobering lesson contained in it. In verse 11, we're told that after telling this to Hazael, Ben-Hadad's next in command, Elisha became so overpowered with emotional pain that he was momentarily speechless. Rashi says that the meaning of the sentence is that Elisha actually turned his face away to try and hide these tears that began to just flow. And between men, for one to just cloud up and break into tears, it's actually pretty uncomfortable to the other man who's witnessing it all. This kind of emotion is not something that we males handle very well. So Hazael was rightly bothered, and he was puzzled by this outburst. And after a few awkward seconds of silence, that must have seemed like an hour's, he asked the great prophet what he was crying about. Now, even though Elisha had publicly upbraided a number of Israelite kings, even, participate, uh, even participating in bringing a famine to the land as punishment for wickedness, he loved the Hebrew people. And what he was about to speak into existence was going to cause them great harm. Because once he delivered... God's message to Hazael, it was going to set into motion great calamities upon the Israelites at the hand of the man who now stood directly in front of him. Even more, it would be Elisha's own vial of oil that he would use to personally anoint Hazael as the new king of Syria in obedience to God, and it would thus empower Hazael to bring about the killing and the pillaging and the oppressions that were in store for Elisha's own countrymen. Well, after Elisha painted a, a gory picture of these atrocities that Hazael would commit, Hazael became like a deer caught in the headlights of an oncoming car. He was taken aback by Elisha's bold statement, but in fact, it was more than that. Hazael's first reaction was, of course, to feign innocence, shock, that anyone could think of him as being capable of such awful things. 
How, he said, even if he wanted to, could he bring something of that magnitude about? Why would Elisha predict such a revolting thing for him? But of course, it was not that we have any mention that God directly told Elisha that this would be the result. Rather, it was something that God told Elisha's master several years ago that he had relayed on to Elisha, and Elisha had never forgotten it. Listen to this excerpt from 1 Kings 19. Adonai said to him, said to Elijah, go back by way of the Damasek desert, and when you get there, anoint Hazael to be king over Aram. Also anoint Yehu, the son of Nimshi, to be king over Israel, and anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Avel Machlah, to be a prophet after you. Yehu will kill whoever escapes, escapes the sword of Hazael, and Elisha will kill whoever escapes, escapes the sword of Yehu. See, the killing that's being described in this last verse of 1 Kings 19 is the killing of Hebrew people. Elisha's people. And not only will Hazael, a Syrian foreigner with a history of hostility against Israel, lead the way, but so will Yehu, an Israelite, kill many Hebrews. But even more, this prophecy says that somehow Elisha is going to be involved. And now is the moment when the fulfillment of that prophecy is being launched. Is it any wonder that Elisha is anguished beyond belief? You know, I probably haven't done a good enough job of communicating what was befalling Elisha at this very moment. So let me get a little bit preachy. Offer something of a personal experience to you. Sometime after the midpoint of my life, as I began to take God's word seriously, studied it more earnestly, I often sat perplexed as believers all around me in church listened to what has become a rather common message about the return of Christ, about Armageddon, the annihilation of tens of millions of people at Jesus' own hand as God's redemptive process enters its final moments. And I was perplexed because invariably the next sound I heard were joyous hallelujahs, excited amen, came from all over the sea of smiling faces surrounding me. And I wondered if that might be these folks' reaction if they were present when it all began to happen. When Christ did appear in the clouds as they stood dumbfounded and then lived through the onslaught as his reappearance sets off a worldwide conflagration the likes of which no horror movie could ever depict because no creative mind could ever imagine it let alone communicate it. You know, I have lived through earthquakes that are so violent that in a few places the earth split apart an inch or two. Asphalt roads were cracked, stopped traffic. I witnessed hot muddy water bubble up, small geysers spout water, boiling water, four or five, six feet into the air through these rather small fissures. And I assure you that the size that earthquake that caused it was pretty large and pretty terrifying and there was always substantial property damage around me. So what will it be like for those who are there when a cataclysmic event causes the Mount of Olives to split under Messiah's feet and the entire mountain changes form? as a Grand Canyon sized valley is created in moments with a rush of water flowing through it all the way from Jerusalem down to the Dead Sea and nearly 4,000 foot elevation drop. 
Do you think that the believers who just happen to be there will be smiling and shouting hallelujah and amen when that happens? Glad to see it all unfolding while they're in the midst of it. You see, it's easy for us to be happily expectant for these prophesied things when we don't actually expect to experience them. We say and we pray and we sing, Lord Messiah, come now. Really? Really? While the beginning of the end would finally be upon us, the means to this end is going to be horrifying. Not glorious. I doubt that any believer is going to have a smile or a look of joy on his or her face. See, it's also comforting when a predicted event is abstract and future and it's only going to affect other people, not me. It's so much more warm and fuzzy to think of the end times in spiritualized terms with an idealized vision of grandeur. The Jews of the mid-20th century knew well the ancient prophecies of a return to their roots. Most of them longed for that day as they had for so many centuries. Theodore Herzl, the founder of modern Zionism, had gone a long way towards finally making the biblical promised land, then called Palestine, a real possibility of becoming a reborn Jewish homeland, which was a necessary ingredient for fulfillment of the Jews' return. But do you think he ever would have spent his adult life working for that end if he had any idea of what would finally have to happen to his family, his people, in World War II to make it all happen? Do you think if you were a Jew living in Europe before Hitler came to power that you'd still be praying daily for a new glorious exodus back to your Jewish homeland if you knew that it would begin in the Nazi death camps? And that you and are most of your loved ones, almost 40% of the entire world Jewish population would not survive those unspeakable horrors. See, Elisha foreknew what lay ahead of him. He knew what his people were in for. He foreknew that by his own hand, he was God's instrument to empower this wicked Hazael to bring horrific judgment upon Israel. Do we find Elisha piously looking heavenward and joyfully saying, Hallelujah, Amen, because God's will is about to be manifest? No. Even his steadfast obedience to the Lord, we find him weeping and utterly distraught. No doubt he was terribly conflicted. He was torn, full of guilt for his role in this. His was a most appropriate response to the reality of the circumstances and one that probably ought to be closer to where our thoughts wander when we sing songs and hear sermons about the end of days. In verse 14, Hazel returns to Aram, to his master Ben-Hadad, and he lies to him by telling him that he's going to recover from his, from his illness, from his sickness. The king of Syria, no doubt, felt at peace now. And so he fell deeply asleep, probably for the first time in days, since he sent Hazael off to inquire of Elisha. Hazael returned some hours later to the king's bedchambers as the weakened Ben-Hadad lay sleeping and unaware. He quietly soaked a blanket with water, placed it over the king's mouth, covering his nostrils as well, and he suffocated him. Elisha's prophecy came true. 
the king died not of his disease, but of murder. And Hazel was now the new king of Aram. Well, starting in verse 16, we get a series of names of kings of Judah and Ephraim Israel. And that can get quite confusing and frustrating because we have a situation whereby sometimes a king of Israel had the same name as a king of Judah. For instance, there was King Yehoram of Judah who ruled for a while at the same time another man named Yehoram was the king of Israel. Now to try and help the befuddled reader, Bible translators long ago called King Yehoram of Judah merely Joram, while calling the other Yehoram, Jehoram. Thus the Yehoram of verse 16 is identified as the one who is the king of Judah, who God regarded as wicked because it is said he ruled in the same manner as the apostate kings of Israel, the northern kingdom. And the reason that this king of Judah was so wicked is that he had married the king of Israel's daughter. And the king of Israel this is referring to is Ahab and his wife was Jezebel. Their daughter was Athaliah. And she became the king of Judah's wife. What's so significant is that here we see these two independent monarchies of Israel and of Judah have become intertwined by marriage. Judah had retained the temple and the Levitical priesthood. And so while by no means had they remained pure, they were basically righteous except for occasional lapses. Judah was far more fastidious in their worship of Jehovah than their counterparts up north who had essentially abandoned the worship of Jehovah. But now with intermarriage of these two royal families, the wickedness of the northern kingdom quickly began to infect the southern kingdom to a far greater level than ever before. In fact, verse 19 tells us that even though he was in the midst of judging Ephraim Israel, Jehovah was withholding the divine judgment that Judah merited, but he did it only for the sake of King David. And this is because the Lord had promised that a vestige of David's dynasty would continue to rule indefinitely. It helps us to understand how quickly Judah slid down that slippery slope to evil when we read a parallel account of what happened upon Jehoram becoming the king of Judah and we read it in 2 Chronicles. You don't have to turn there, I'll read it to you. 2 Chronicles, starting, uh, 2 Chronicles 21 starting in verse 1. Jehoshaphat slept with his ancestors and he was buried with his ancestors in the city of David and Jehoram his son became king in his place. He had brothers who were sons of Jehoshaphat. Azariah, Yechiel, Zechariah, Aziau, Mechael, Shephtayu, and all these were sons of Jehoshaphat king of Israel. Their father had given them lavish gifts of silver and gold and other items of value as well as fortified cities in Judah. But he had given the kingdom to Jehoram because he was the firstborn. But when Jehoram had taken control of his father's kingdom and consolidated his rule, he put the sword to all of his brothers and a number of the leading men in Israel. He was 32 years old when he began his rule, and he ruled for eight years in Jerusalem. He lived after the example of the kings of Israel, as did the house of Ahav, because he had married Ahav's daughter. He did what was evil from Adonai's perspective. So upon his assuming the throne of Judah completely legitimately, Yehoram proved his wickedness by immediately killing off 
all of his brothers for no reason other than he wanted for himself the portion of wealth that their father had given to them. Now what is interesting is how in 2 Kings the Lord places direct blame on Jezebel and her daughter, her daughter Athaliah, as the source of this spirit of apostasy for the most recent generations of kings of both Israel and Judah. Both, or rather, King Jehoram of Judah had made the fatal mistake of combining Judah's religion with pragmatic politics by marrying Athaliah to create this alliance with the northern kingdom. And God was not about to let this stand. So in verse 20, we hear that the kingdom of Edom, which had been a vassal state under Israel for one and a half centuries, rebelled. They reestablished their own independence and declared their own king. But starting in verse 21, the problem of dealing with the names of the kings surfaces again. And the problem is we have two kings with the same name ruling over Judah and Israel. Now the complete Jewish Bible, as do many other translations, seem to have it that it was Jehoram king of Israel who responded to this rebellion of Edom by sending an army. But Israel had no treaty with Edom. Edom was Judah's vassal. So this must be Judah's king, Jehoram, that sent troops, not Israel's. And I'm certain of this. I'm frankly astounded that so many Bible translators have got it wrong. That due to a number of reasons, this solution becomes very self-evident. And I'm going to address that momentarily. But the army tried to use the cover of darkness to make a surprise attack. And this is something we've seen was a historical and traditional tactic of the Israelites. But their attempts failed. They quickly found themselves surrounded by the Edomites. And the non-professional soldiers that made up the bulk of Judah's army panicked and they bolted and they fled back to their homes. Now no doubt this wasn't the only attempt to try and keep Edom under Judah's control. But in the end, as verse 22 explains, Edom broke away and they remained independent from that time forward. In fact, another Edomite city named Lidna that was located near the border of Judah, they joined in the rebellion of their brethren once they, I guess, felt confident that Edom would win. Well, next we're told <clears throat> that there were many other kings, or rather many other things that Jehoram, king of Judah, did and that they're recorded in the annals of the kings of Judah. Notice that the verse is speaking of the king who attacked Edom and says his history is recorded where? In the annals of the kings of Judah. So here's further evidence as to which king Jehoram is being referred to. But more than that, there is a full parallel account of this misadventure that's recorded in 2 Chronicles 21. And it's worth reading. Because not only does it make it clear that the king who attacked Edom was the Judahite king, but it also gives us several interesting details about what went on that's not contained in 2 Kings. So open up your Bibles to 2 Chronicles chapter 21. 2 Chronicles chapter 21. If you have a complete Jewish Bible, it's page 1203. 2 Chronicles chapter 21. We're going to start reading at verse 8. <clears throat> During his time, Edom revolted against Judah and set up its own king. Then Jehoram crossed with his commanders and all of his chariots. And under cover of night, he and his chariot commanders attacked and defeated Edom, who had surrounded him. Nevertheless, since that day, Edom has remained free of Judah's domination. Libna revolted against him at the same time because he had abandoned Adonai, the god of his ancestors. Moreover, he built high places in the hills of Judah, caused the people living in Jerusalem to prosper. 
uh, to prostitute themselves, and he drew Judah away. A letter came to him from Eliyahu the prophet, which said, Here is what Adonai, the God of David, your ancestor, says. You have not lived by the examples of Jehoshaphat, your father, or Asa, king of Judah. Instead, you have lived by the example of the kings of Israel and have caused Judah and the people living in Jerusalem to prostitute themselves, just as the house of Ahab caused Israel to prostitute themselves. Moreover, you killed your brothers from your father's house, men better than you. And because of all this, Adonai is going to strike your people with a terrible disease. Also your children, your wives, everything you have. You will be ill, very ill, from a disease in your intestines until your intestines protrude because of the effects of this disease day after day. And then Adonai aroused against Yehoram the spirit of the Philistines and of the Arabs near the Ethiopians. And they came up to attack Judah. And they broke in and carried off all the personal property they could find in the royal palace as well as his children and his wives so that no son was left to him except Yehoahaz, his youngest son. And after all this, Adonai struck him in his intestines with an incurable disease. In time, after two years, his intestines protruded because of his disease. And he suffered a most painful death. His people kindled no fire for him, as had been done for his ancestors. He was 32 years old when he began his reign. He ruled in Jerusalem for eight years, and he left without joy. They buried him in the city of David, but not in the tombs of the kings. In the end, this wicked king of Judah died a terrible and an agonizing death. And he was replaced by his son Ahazah. Ahazah was 22 years old when he took over Judah's throne. But he was at least as bad as his father and he only lasted for a year. He was considered as such a bad and evil king that when he was buried in the city of Deva, he wasn't entombed in the catacombs set aside for Judah's kings. Rather, he was buried in the commoners' burial grounds of that same city. Now, as I mentioned a bit earlier, the writer of 2 Kings goes out of his way to pinpoint the source of the spirit of evil that accelerated both Israel's and Judah's demise. And that source is Jezebel and her daughter Athaliah. And that is the reason for these passages referring to Ahaziah's mother as Athaliah. Verse 27 again makes the connection that while Ahaziah was the king of Judah, he was closely connected by blood in her marriage to the house of Ahav. That means the dynasty of Ahav, a, a king of Israel that actually began uh, with his father, Omri. So the idea is that whereas Judah and Israel were at one time virtually of opposite character, Israel was apostate, Judah was righteous, the reason for Judah's fall into the same kind of apostasy and idolatry that would eventually cause God to exile the ten tribes of the northern kingdom from the land was that Judah's kings mixed their blood with the evil dynasty of Omri, rulers of Israel. Verse 28 shows how because the rulers of Judah and Israel were closely related, the two kingdoms now became closely aligned. And so they made another joint effort to push back the territory of Syria that was now being ruled by Hazael. And this effort focused on the city of remote Gilead that had long been an Israelite city in the Transjordan. But one of the consequences of that battle was that Yehoram, king of Israel, was wounded seriously enough that he was taken to the royal palace in Jezreel to recover. Akazah, king of Judah, who had fought alongside Yehoram at remote Gilead, went to pay a state visit to Yehoram as he convalesced up in Jezreel. And we're going to end today's lesson now, but, but I want to end it with this thought. Fourteen years earlier, 
Ahaziah's grandfather, Jehoshaphat, had done the same wrong thing by uniting with the wicked king of Israel in a battle against the common enemy. The result was defeat. And the king of Israel, Ahav at that time, lost his life in the process. Interestingly, that battle was over the same city, remote Gilead, as in our 2 Kings 8 story. And in chapter 9, we're going to see that the current kings of Israel and Judah, now both related by blood to King Ahab, are all going to, also going to suffer his same fate. God's patterns are his chief governing dynamic. We would be well to remember that. Father, blessed be your name. And Lord, I don't want this weekend to pass that even though it be a secular day to remember, to remember our brave soldiers who have given their lives on the field of battle to form this country and to make this country. Father, they made it a free nation so that we could worship you freely. And Father, now this same thing is under attack. And Lord, I just pray that soon we will have leadership. We will have it in the hearts of the people of our nation to repent, to turn back to you, to make you the true king of America that we would look up to you and see our sin, see our personal responsibility. Father, you make it clear that there is two types of redemption and thus two types of judgment. There's personal and there's national. Father, indeed, those of us who have taken Yeshua into our hearts are saved and redeemed before you. And we will not be judged. But as members of a nation, Father, we will suffer the fate of that nation. So, Lord, I pray that you will turn us from our apostasy. Turn us from the wicked ways we have entered and are heading. That we might not have to come under your severity. Father, if you choose to do so, though, let us be strong in our faith. Let us be willing to open our mouths and be bold and tell our friends and tell our neighbors what is happening and why. We bless your holy name here, Lord. And as we walk out of this place today, we know your spirit goes with us. Wherever we go, Lord, it doesn't matter if the depths of the ocean or the heights of the sky. You are with us. That is such a great comfort. We thank you, O oh Lord God. We thank you, Holy Spirit. We thank you, Yeshua, that you are one. Blessed be your name. Amen.